guys, welcome to Iron for Ultras podcast. I'm Shanali Sen and today we have a very special guest for you. Jean Dykes, a 70-year-old marathoner, is not just one of the fastest runners in his age group, but one of the fastest runners period. He recently broke a uh, Ed Whitlock's record uh, with style by almost 25 seconds with a time of 2 hours 54 minutes and 23 seconds. So let's get straight into it. Gene, welcome to Iron for Ultra. Hello there. Uh, looking forward to chatting. Yes. So let's get straight into it. You know, so how does a computer, a retired computer programmer and biochemist, uh, you know, rediscover running at a late stage in their life? How does it happen? Tell us. Oh, it's just uh, one of those happy coincidences. Uh, you look back on life and you find these turning points where your whole life changes. And uh, this will certainly rank right up there with one of them. Uh, I hadn't run in six years because during one of my uh, just pleasure runs, I got the mad notion that, hey, I think I'll sprint in and beat this guy. And I tore my hamstring, couldn't run for six years, and uh, hadn't even thought about running again for a while. But my daughter managed to strike up a conversation with her teammate's dad on the way to a cross-country meet. And he was saying how he needed a fourth for golf. And my daughter, bless her heart, said, my dad, my dad, he'll play with anybody. <laughs> he'll never pass up a chance for a golf game. So I was uh, Shanghai'd into a golf game with a guy. And, and there he mentioned that he had a running group and that I should join them. And after a couple months, I uh, took him up on that uh, offer. And uh, that's where it all began. I discovered that my six-year injury seemed to have finally alleviated and uh, so I worked up so I I remember you know three mile run <gasps> boy you know next week I'd, I'd try and do five miles and, and it was just uh, just a, a real journey of rediscovery of what it meant to run uh, longer and longer distances and so that's how it all started I mean all into the bad crowd and things like that happened and obviously, once it started, the floodgates opened, and so far you've been running for 12 years, I believe. But what are some of the biggest differences you would say from running back in the day, you know, in your youth and running today, uh, both in terms of, you know, physical stuff, technology, and also mentally? Oh, I certainly remember the, the bad old days. Uh... You know, you can imagine, you know, Ked sneakers and, you know, baggy sweatsuits. And, and it was before those first uh, running books that promoted running. So it wasn't a craze uh, when I was out there. And uh, I, I, I attracted this attention. People would stare. You know, dogs would go berserk, not being used to seeing uh, humans run by. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's what it was like way back then. Nowadays, uh, oh, I, I guess, no, I don't pine for the good old days. Uh, you know, I love my Garmin watch. Uh, I, I'm married to it when I'm looking, doing, work, doing pace work. Uh, the shoes, shoes are incredibly, uh, incredibly comfortable. Hard to believe I thought those shoes back then were, were, were good. Uh, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with the uh, with the headphones. Uh, uh, I'll wear them as a last resort when there's nobody else to, to gab with on a run. But you know, I'd never dream of doing them in a race. And you know, frankly, I just have a hard time understanding why people who are just out having a fun race would would wear headphones and drown out the sounds of the race. Uh, to me, every race is unique. Uh, yeah, and I want to experience it all. And here are these people listening to the same music they've listened to a thousand times and and uh, not paying attention to the race. You know, kind of confounds me. But, yeah, new generation. I got to say, I got to cut them some slack. <laughs> so, of course, you know, you've talked about the gear and everything. What would you say mentally is the biggest difference up here? Excuse me? Well, 
what would you say you, you know, you've talked about definitely you know in you know in technology and how things have changed but other than that how would you say mentally uh, it's uh, you know how how are you different from when you were younger well i was competitive in high school uh, i really wanted to to excel there and i did okay in the 2 mile and i got to college and uh, my perception changed uh, radically i was blown off the track teammates competitors you name it heck the other team had a mascot he probably would have beaten me so uh from then on my mental attitude was look thanks you're a, a mediocre runner at best you know concentrate on sports you're good at so uh i threw myself into things like golf and bowling uh i enjoyed uh running though so i kept jogging now and then but i had a jogger's mentality sometimes in shape sometimes not who cares and uh that didn't change until you know this new new phase in my life started when and then i kind of so i kind of split my running career now into those two phases one where i run just for fun and one where i run for competition uh ultras is where i run for fun road races is where i run for competition and uh i think the two complement each other uh I, I certainly don't get bored that way. Um, your Skype has frozen. Ah, uh, well, I'm, I'm still kicking on this end. I see you're still kicking. Okay. I don't I don't know what happened there. Okay, so we'll just pick up from the uh, next question then. Uh, you averaged, a, in you know, while setting the record, you averaged a, a, the pace of six thirty nine. That's insane. That's very impressive. What goes into that, and and you know, what goes into that kind of, you know, getting that kind of a pace? What kind of training? So that pace sounds kind of daunting to you, does it? Yeah. Believe me, it, it, it's daunting to me too when I step to the starting line uh, because it's it's a hard pace. Uh, I when my coach prescribes a workout where I have to run that pace, it's it's grueling. Even if I only have to do it for a couple miles, uh, uh, it's. But you have to trust your training, and tapering is a part of the training, and it's the magic of the taper that allows you to do things that just seem otherwise uh, impossible. And that's what I do when I get to the start line. Uh, I, I don't let myself be afraid of the speed I'm going to do. I say, I'm trained to do this. I know I can do it. I'm going to start doing it, and I'm going to keep on doing it. And uh, nothing's going to nothing's going to stop me. And uh, that's that's an important mental attitude to have, that you, the, the don't quit attitude. Of course, maybe it wouldn't be so great if you were had an injury. <laughs> you have to know, be able to tell the difference. But uh, no. No, don't quit. Don't quit. That's that's a good that's a good um, a good piece of advice for sure. So let's talk about you know breaking Ed's record. Like, did you did you follow Ed's uh, career? Was he an inspirational figure for you? And at what stage did you decide to break his record? Well, he was certainly somebody all marathoners talked about. Uh, he was, uh, you know seen so far of us all, I, I never dreamed about taking on his records, uh, certainly during the first seven years that, that I ran. Once I hired a coach, yeah, probably still not. It wasn't until I'd had a coach for two years and started improving rapidly that I said, if I keep improving, you know, maybe there's one of his records I can take down. And so I, I looked on the web and I found this obscure website that listed marathon records by single age. and Lo and behold, uh, although his uh, age group record of 254 when he was 73, when he was 70, he only ran three hours and 23 seconds. And I said, I can do that. And uh, so that motivated my training for the next uh, bunch of years. Uh, the fact that I thought I had a chance to take down this, uh, this record. Uh, and, but it wasn't until until I did take down that record by a substantial amount uh, earlier this year that uh, 
I had the, uh, the chutzpah to say, well, maybe I can go for that uh, age group record too. Uh, maybe I can keep on improving uh, this year. And, uh, and well, it, it turned out. It's, it's, it's you know, still kind of a shock to me. It, it, it happened so quickly. Just wasn't on my radar screen in January, and now here I am talking to you. That's true, and 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 there were. I mean, the, the, a lot went into getting to this place. Uh, you 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 missed the record by thirty four seconds in Toronto in October. T uh, talk to us about that experience, and how do you bounce back from that? Well, well one the real reason I bounced back is because I really went into Toronto not sure that I could do it. Uh, I had originally intended to try at Jacksonville, but Oh, the folks at Canada Running Series put together this article after I talked to them. You know, I had told them, I'm not going to be ready. Don't make a big deal out of it. But no, they, 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 they published an article entitled, Can This American Take Down Ed Whitlock's Record? And, you know, well, they, they put it out there. They'd thrown down the gauntlet. So my coach and I scrambled and, you know, decided that maybe I had a chance to train for it in time. Uh... But going into it, we both agreed that it would be close, and uh, that's how it turned out. It was close. I gave it my all, and it wasn't enough. So, so no, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't overly disappointed. Uh, I, I, I couldn't do any better at the time. So, should I try at Jacksonville? Uh, having decided that I would try at Toronto, I filled up my schedule with all kinds of other stuff. But. I decided I would go for it secretly. I wasn't going to tell anybody. I mean, you don't want to be the guy who cried wolf. If I failed at Toronto and then failed at Jackson with everybody cheering me on, it would, nah, that would just be too much to take. So I hardly told anybody that uh, I was going to try at Jacksonville. In fact, I even tried some misdirection. Uh, two weeks before Jacksonville, I, uh, I uh, ran an ultra marathon with my uh, daughter. It was her first ultra marathon. I wouldn't miss that for the world, you know, family first. And so we ran the uh, 50K, uh, 50K trail race. But knowing that I would be all the way over in California for that race, uh, the following day was the California International Marathon. I said, well, why not run two races in one weekend and get my money's worth out of this plane ticket? And that's what I did. So I ran the California International Marathon the next day. And I pretty much told everybody who knew that I was coming up to the Jacksonville that, that, oh, I'll try and put in a decent effort, but, you know, what can you expect after running a, a 50K and a marathon on consecutive days two weeks before the race? Secretly, I said, I could do this. Uh, did I, was I sure I could do this? Uh, no, uh, I wasn't, but, hey, you have to try. And, uh, and it worked out. It was sort of a gamble that paid off. Well, well, it was definitely a gamble that paid off, and you set this amazing record. Uh, you obviously, you know, it's it wasn't an easy run by any means. Um, what were some of the challenges that you faced? I know that leg cramps was a part of it, but what were some of the challenges that you faced along the race? On the route from uh, Toronto to uh, Jacksonville. Uh, no, specifically, specifically Jacksonville, and also like, what are some of the? Is is there a pattern to some of the? You know, like if, is this because different runners, you know, they find different walls that they hit that they find the toughest. What what are your challenges and specific to Jacksonville? Well, we pretty much kept up the same training schedule, and uh, well, I threw in that ultra marathon two weeks before. That's not that's not typical, and who knows? Maybe uh, that's that's my secret. Uh, I, I know I use ultra marathons as uh, base training, but this is the first time I've tried to use one as a as the long run before uh, before a marathon. Uh, the biggest challenge, oh, that's that's easy. The biggest challenge is is weight. When I knew I was going to go into Jacksonville, I drew up this chart and said I'm going to start here at 142, and I have to finish at uh, 138. And uh, the you know, you'd go up and down, but it was generally descending. But somehow over Thanksgiving and the following week, I managed to totally screw it up. And I weighed 142 again just one week before Jacksonville. And, well, 
Well, necessity is the mother of invention. I lost five pounds in the next four days to make weight. You know, I felt like a wrestler in a, a wrestler in college, trying to make weight. And but that's that's important. At two pounds per uh, two seconds per pound per mile, if I hadn't if I had lost only three pounds by pure physics, I shouldn't have been able to uh, to break the record. But uh, it was just enough weight. So yeah. Losing weight, that's, that's the hardest, hardest part of training, especially when you have a seafood diet. You know, I, I tend to eat anything I see. Gene, you also, you know, talk about your ability to recover. You know, you say that it's your superpower. Uh, tell us, what do you think attributes to you being able to recover this fast? No, I don't think that it's some genetic uh, advantage I have. Uh, I think it comes from uh, the kind of adventure running that I, uh, I enjoy. I would start out with supported adventure runs and then stage races and, you know, and finally 200 miles, which are essentially four day, uh, four day stage races. And I basically taught my body to recover. If you have to run 20 miles a day in a stage race, uh, it, it's amazing. At the end, you start feeling stronger than you did at the beginning. And, and that I think carries over to uh, a lot of my training. So, that would be my, it seems to be the thing that separates me from other marathon runners. I don't know of any other uh, marathon runners uh, at, at the top of the world that, that do big long ultras. I don't think Ed ever did a single ultra. Uh, so might be something there. At first when I signed up for ultras, my coach would bang his head against the wall, you know, like, no, no, you're supposed to concentrate on, on road running. But I think he's, I think he's over on my side of the fence now. He thinks there's something to it. And uh, so I can't stress enough to people that it's not only the great fun, it's also great base training for a marathon. And speaking of stage races, you did the Triple Crown, which is Moab, uh, Bigfoot and Tahoe. Uh, th tell us about that experience and which one was your favorite? Oh, those, those are just incredible races. Uh, Bigfoot was the first one. Uh, Again, you know, you can't let fear rule your life. Can I do a 200-mile race? <laughs> I'm going to sign up and do it. But, you know, you'll never know until you try. And uh, I saw lots of people out there who finished the race who clearly have uh, far less cred than uh, a lot of these people who think they can't do a 200. Uh, if you, to some extent, it's true. If you can do a 50, you can do a 100. If you can do a 100, you can do 200, and and so on. Uh, you know, you're, you're basically running bonked after 70 or 80 miles, and uh, it doesn't get worse than that. I mean, what's what's worse than being bonked? You know, so it, it it doesn't get worse. You just learn to run within the energy that your body can uh, can drum up. Um, Bigfoot was just an uh, amazing thing. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you do for four days straight. You're sleep deprived. It, it, it penetrates your, your consciousness and goes deep into your subconscious. Uh, I can tell because every day I'll be just minding my own business. All of a sudden I'll have this flashback to, to some aspect of the race. And, uh, and, and that's a good thing. Boy, do I love to be reminded of it. And uh, uh, Tahoe was great. Moab was wonderful. Uh, you can't let, the, let yourself think 238 miles. How can you do that? You just sign up, go run. Odds are you'll you'll get there. If you don't, suppose you only run 200 miles. You'll have the time of your life in that 200 miles. You know, just 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 run. Just run. So, which yeah. was your favorite? Uh, just run. Which was your favorite? 
Now, well, Bigfoot was easily my favorite, but it's sort of like asking, you know, which of my daughters is my favorite? No way I'm going to answer that because you know, they're both my favorite. Uh, but it's my favorite 200. Uh, I have a favorite 50 that I like to push out there, uh, the Kiga Trails 50. Uh, marvelous race. Uh, it's in Ithaca, New York. Incredible scenery, well run. Uh, the trails are a delight. If you're ever in, out in the east in the early June, you know, give that one a look. Well, well, we'll definitely keep an eye out for that. But speaking of keeping an eye out, what, what, what's there for in your running future? What are some of the races we can look forward to? Uh, any projects you're involved with? I, I believe there's a book you want to write that you can't quite get to, but we, we want to know what, what all do you have planned uh, in the near future? Well, this was an unusual year. Uh, normally, I pick out all the, the grand adventure runs I want to have, you know, the, the big long ultras, and I'll scope those out, and then I'll fill in competitive races with what's left over. This year I was 70, I said, I guess I owe it to myself to see what I can do. So I signed up for every national championship race. Uh, yeah. Some of this was cross country, track, road, trail, didn't matter, uh, or a place where I could set a record. And then, uh, and that turned out to be quite a lot of races, but I managed to squeeze in some ultras too. But I ran uh, 40 races this year. Uh, so uh, that's going to, I don't know, I might run that many races next year. Who knows? But next year it's back to let's find the what are the most fun runs I can do and whatever's left over, uh, I'll compete. I'm starting out with four big ultras in January and February. Uh, looking forward to uh, 100 in North Dakota in in uh, July. Uh, there are two states I've never been to, so I'm going to use an ultra to hit both those states. Uh, North Dakota I haven't been to, and I'm going to do the, the Mada Hay 100. That'll leave one state left, Nebraska, so uh, if any listeners here uh, know of the best race in Nebraska to do to pick off my 50th state, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. But uh, January and February, uh, traveling to Louisiana, Texas, Utah, and Australia uh, to do these races. 250s, a 100, and a 200. Uh, boy, am I looking forward to those. Tell us a little more about the race in Australia. What are you looking forward to, and what are you not looking forward to? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, uh, well, I guess I'm not really looking forward to being sleep deprived for four days again, but it's part of the experience, so uh, I'll look back on it. To, uh, unfortunately, in Australia, it's not entirely untrue that all the wildlife there is out to kill you. So uh, it's still, I haven't decided whether I'm going to wear snake gaiters or not. I guess I'll find out as the race gets closer what the people who live there are doing. And uh, it doesn't mean I still will. It's, people tend to overrate risky things as riskier than they really are. And I, if if snakes were really that dangerous on this trail, then, you know, they'd probably close it down from people dying. So, you know, but of course, then again, I may not tell, be able to tell the difference between a snake and a stick on the trail when, the, when you're really tired. But truth be told, I'm not scared of snakes. I'm, I'm scared of spiders. And uh, Yes, indeed, I've been told, yeah, they spin webs right across the trail. So I'll do that old trick of making sure that uh, somebody's ahead of me and hope he doesn't figure out why I'm behind him. Well, that's a good plan of action. I, I, I would agree with that. <laughs> um, I would agree with that strategy. <laughs> uh, let somebody else deal with the spiders. Uh, well, and moving on, uh, Jean, we live in a world where youth is prized more than anything else. And then, of course, we have people like you, Mark Omo, Ed, who come along and shatter all those notions. Uh, what would you say to all those people out there who say, well, I could never do that? Well, if you can't do that, I say, have you tried? And the answer is invariably no. And too many people let fear of failure uh, influence them. I I signed up for all kinds of stuff. I had no idea if I could do it. And uh, uh, I failed once, uh, but 
So what? I, I said, well, I tackled something that was beyond my ability there. I'll, you know, lesson learned. There's, there's no shame in that. And uh, so, yeah, get out there and, and try it. There's so many different aspects of running to try that there's bound to be something that you can say, hey, I'm going to do something uh, better and faster or more often in, in that area than others. Yeah, there's just, there's just so much good stuff out there. What are some of the reactions you get from people when you're when you're there, and you know when they come up to you? What is it that you find people say to you, and what kind of uh, you know re reactions do you get from them? Yeah, the, uh, I used to not get all that much attention, but one of the things my daughter did for me was buy me this bright pink shirt with hashtag Ultra Geezer on it, and. Uh, and it has my age and the number of races I run. And when you wear this shirt, it's a little hard to run under the radar. And so people will ask, you know, how do you run, you know, uh, you know usually it's how can you keep do this at your age? And, well, there are three keys. Uh, one is uh, don't be an elite runner when you're, when you're young. That's the best way to be an elite runner when you're old. Uh, uh, get a coach. And do ultras. Ultras is ultras is the definitely the way to make all running all running easier and more fun. So uh, uh, you can't believe the number of people I've tried to talk into talk into doing ultras, and I've had some success. Uh, I'm doing a 50 miler in uh, Utah in late January. I've got uh, four other people going, two of whom have never run that distance before. So. Uh, uh, well, maybe my uh, my proselytizing is uh, starting to bear fruit. Obviously, you're getting more people to participate. Oh, that's for sure. But th this, uh, especially ultra marathons and running, ha has been a sport that's been kind of nurtured by the people in there. But what is it that you think uh, can be done to garner more participation? What can be done to support more? Uh, people and be more inclusive, especially when it comes to the older age ranges. Well, road races certainly know how to do it. They have, uh, you know, even the, the smallest 5Ks out there have five-year age groups. They give awards three down. Uh, and that certainly motivates them. I think ultras, and in many cases, it's true. They say running it is its own reward. And uh, oh, I'm all on board with that. I, I do lots of ultras. That, uh, don't do anything but say congratulations to the winner at the end. Uh, but there are several ultras that I think are dropping the ball. They promote themselves as competitive races, but then they completely ignore uh, the older runners. Uh, uh, one of my, one of the things I'd really like to see is, is Western states. They have this concept of golden tickets and you have to be an elite to get a golden ticket. But why couldn't they allocate, say, four spots for the male and female 60 or male and female 70, something you know, something like that, where a, a certain 100 would be the qualifying site? And uh, I'll bet that, that would become a great storyline in itself. The, the old geezers and geezerettes that are out there vying for that golden ticket. And uh, plus, another thing is, well, just my own personal uh, uh, thing is I would like to be the oldest person to ever finish Western State. But to do that, uh, I have to uh, qualify for it. And, you know, if I don't qualify when I'm still alive, well, you know, I, I'm out of luck. But if I could get a golden ticket, then you know, I'd have that chance on, on merit as opposed to, as opposed to luck. Uh, you'd be amazed at some of the big races that are competitive that leave out older guys. Comrades, the biggest ultra marathon in the world by far, their last age group is 60 plus. I mean, 12,000 runners, and the best they can do is is, is stop at age 60. I, I really don't understand that. Uh, Trans Rockies, they have these sponsorships. They've got Trans Rockies stage race. They've got gear out the wazoo to give away. and. They give it away to the same elite runners night after night after night. And I'm sitting here, I was, I think, 67 when I ran that race, and they put me in the open division. I mean, 
all, all this stuff to a ward and they couldn't they couldn't create an age group. I mean, heck, I would have done it for a candy bar, you know, but it's really annoying to see all this great gear going on. No, uh, if they advertise themselves as competitive, they should be inclusive. Uh, uh, I, I just uh, don't understand why they don't, uh, don't cater to us a little more. Well, wise words uh, from Eugene, definitely about, uh, you know, being inclusive and also, you, you, you know, you're not just, you, you're doing it the right way. You're not just uh, stating what the issue is. You're also giving the solution. So if they're listening to you out there, well, he's told you golden tickets for hey. for the older, uh, older runners, for sure. Def definitely. So well, either that or I'm going to get black from from every, <laughs> every race I try to enter from now on. <laughs> I don't see that happening, Gene. I don't see you. You're an inspiring figure, uh, figure for sure. And um, finally, why don't you leave us with a few uh, words of uh, wisdom for you know the people who are aspiring to be runners, or even just people who, you know, who are listening to you, who want to be motivated. Or what words do you have for them? Well, I guess I should reiterate some of the things I've said. Is that uh, you don't have to win races to enjoy it. Uh, even if you're competitive, uh, my main competitor is that guy in the mirror. I, I, I want to beat him. Uh, I want to beat his last mile in a race. I want to beat him from last week. I want to beat him from last year. And uh, as long as you're, uh, you know, making an effort to improve, boy, that's that's the greatest reward running uh, running has to offer. Uh, if you think you've got more in you and you're not getting it out, well, the, the the way is clear. You have to hire a coach. Uh, if you're short on money, you go with a standard program, but you have to do something that keeps you accountable because, you know, if you're anything like me, uh, without a coach, you know, I just turn over in bed and go back to sleep. I mean, but uh, I, I'd rather die than tell my coach I couldn't finish a workout. So that's, that's a, that's, that's huge. So, and don't, don't let fear rule, rule your, like, don't wait until you know you're ready. Go out there and give it a try before then. That's, that, it's just so much fun out there to be had. Just Run, huh? Yep, Just Run. That's a book I'm never going to, it's the working title of a book that I'm never going to get around to writing. Never say never, Gene. Next thing you know, you'll be a bestseller and a runner. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure you're my first reader. I'll send you the the copy before it gets published. <laughs> Looking forward to it, Jean. And thank you again for talking to Iron for Ultra. Uh, you know, thank you for giving us your time and uh, we'll catch you out there. Okay, great. See you soon. See you soon. Bye.